Well, welcome everybody as you come beaming on into the live live show tonight. Welcome to uh, rock to, How to Rock the Stage book release party featuring CJ Grace. Tonight we're going to have a great time with the book release party. You're going to be involved in this from start to finish. We have a lot of opportunity to engage. Chances for you to be able to win prizes along the way. And also you'll be able to ask questions of the author and expert herself. My name is Rich Bontrager. I'll be your host tonight. And I am the CEO and founder of Rock the Stage. And we do usually at this time, my show, Rock the Stage, is going live. But we interrupted our regular broadcast to bring you CJ Grace and this amazing book launch party. Tonight is also extra special because it's the book release party combined with Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And we intentionally chose this to be all interconnected together. And just so we kind of frame this up, everybody, one in eight women in the United States will develop breast cancer in her lifetime. Tonight, we're gonna to sit, talk, laugh, and learn from a lady that has battled breast cancer twice in her life. But it's gonna be a lot of fun. I promise there will be some joy in this. It's not all a downer. Tonight, we're here to celebrate and talk with CJ Grace, the author of My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. Tonight, we'll learn about some of her personal journey of surviving breast cancer, along with facing the hard truth of her husband's infidelity and how to rise back up and smile and laugh and have an amazing life. Just a couple of reminders as we get rolling here tonight, please keep your mics muted so that we can have a great quality sound, a great experience for everybody. And this is being recorded so that CJ can have this to share and put it out there further and further. Later, we will open up those mics and we will let you come on in and ask your own ca uh, questions, cameras, microphones, or the chat box will be open as well. But before we get deep into this, we're gonna have a special guest beam on here tonight, Linda Fisk is going to come center stage with me right now. I have had the pleasure of knowing Linda Fisk for several years. She's a CEO and founder of Lead Hership Global. She's a keynote speaker, best-selling author herself, and the official member of the Forbes Business Council. Good evening and welcome, Linda. Thank you so much, Rich. What a pleasure to be here in celebration of CJ Grace. CJ is absolutely one of the most dynamic, uplifting, encouraging leaders I've ever met. And that's saying something, given the fact that she has faced some of the most daunting challenges that I think a woman can face. A diagnosis of breast cancer, not once, but twice, and also the infidelity of her husband. And yet, despite those challenges, despite those really daunting, and some may say even traumatic experiences, I find CJ to be one of the most clever, uplifting, encouraging, humorous people I've ever met. She is a former BBC journalist. And I think that that has really informed her books, uh, both her first one, which was a humor, humorous kind of a self-help book, The Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive When You Stay or Not. And it, of course, became an international bestseller. And I think that a lot of the success that CJ experienced in her first book, Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive Whether You Stay or Not, is due to the fact that she has this incredible wisdom and acumen from being a BBC journalist, but it's integrated with this incredible dry wit and this incredible sort of perspective about life that gives you a sense of hope and gives you a sense of optimism even in the face of what could be some of the most traumatic experiences that you could experience as a woman. Um, in fact, when Ariana Huffington received a copy of her first book, she invited CJ to be a Huffington Post contributor. So that says a little bit about the kind of impact that CJ made with her first book. But I tell you, it's only going to be trumped by her second book. Her second book, which we're celebrating tonight, is My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Fidelity. And as you noted, Rich, it is perfectly timed this October, which is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And this book is amazing. It's actually a candid, kind of comic, and also for sure, a cancer survival guide. For anyone who has been touched by cancer, you know how devastating that diagnosis can be. 
Yet CJ dealt with it with humor and grace as she seems to deal with everything in life. But she also had the double whammy of discovering her husband's infidelity shortly after being diagnosed with breast cancer. And she, of course, refused to be the victim. And so she, a sense of humor, wrote this book, and it is destined to be an international bestseller for sure. The good news is that CJ did not um, sort of suffer fools and she divorced her husband and now she's US based, she lives in Hawaii and she and I have talked extensively about the decision to divorce her husband. I tell you, she has the most compassionate, kind, gentle heart towards her ex-husband in that she actually pities him. And she sort of, I think in a lot of ways recognizes his shortcomings and has forgiven him, which I think is remarkable. And so now divorced in US based, she insists that the obstacles that she's faced have actually enabled her to make better midlife decisions than she would have in her younger years. And so what a wonderful perspective is that. Linda Fisk, thank you for your kind words. CJ is smiling already. We're off to a great start, everybody. Linda Fisk, the CEO and founder of Lead Her Chef, helping to get things rolling here tonight. But now it's time to bring in our major guest here tonight, and the ex-BBC journalist, inspirational speaker, CJ Grace, the author of the humorous self-help book we were just talking about, The Adulterous Wife, How to Thrive, Whether You Stay or Not, and now the new book, My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. It is a candid comic memoir survival guide. It's a lifelong kind of mighty python. She's a lifelong Mighty Python fan. She drops humor into the books, and she has an eye for the absurdity as well, and she weaves it in here. CJ was a BBC broadcaster, a voiceover artist in the UK, later working for China Radio International in Beijing. And CJ helps women use adversity as a catalyst for positive change. You can learn more about CJ at cjauthor.com. Also, she has some free resources, some other exciting things. But right now, if you can give me the virtual hand clap, the virtual smile and wave, let's welcome CJ Grace to the virtual stage. Good evening. Welcome, CJ, to your party. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. You know, and as, 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 as we start off here, I, I, I want to read a brief little excerpt from the book to set the stage for those that maybe don't know some of this. Um, because it's really amazing. You, you put this right in the early forward of your book. I had been living in a charmed life. My dream job as a journalist with the BBC in Britain, meeting celebrities, politicians, fascinating people who were making their mark in the world. The excitement of having my finger on the pulse of current events. Then a transferring to the Beijing Radio International and a fairy tale falling in love with an American I met. Our 25th wedding anniversary was the best one ever. Spent in Hawaii, where we had bought a second home. I was in the land of gods. Little did I know that just two years later, both my marriage and my health would be tatters. That's intense to read, CJ. Just stay in that moment there. Don't go too far, but take us back. What did it feel like to realize everything you had dreamed, everything you wanted, now is upside down? Well, it was like the earth had opened up to swallow me. It was devastating, absolutely devastating, because I had never thought that I would ever leave my husband or have problems with my marriage, especially since we were getting on better at that time, at least in my mind, <laughs> than I thought we ever had. Um, and I had been through cancer before in 2007. It was a uh, I needed radiation for that. It wasn't anywhere near as bad as the second time I had cancer. I thought I had been there, done that. You know, I do have one of those BRCA genes that makes me more susceptible to cancer, a nice little gift from my Ashkenazi uh, relatives. But uh, I thought, you know, I'm fine. I'm living a healthy life. No. Nope. <laughs> so that, re that, that reality smacks you. What helped you cope with the breast cancer and your husband's in infidelity? What, what really got you through that? Well, I knew that I didn't want to be revenge driven. Um, I, I saw all of these 
websites online where people are sort of so vitriolic about their exes who've been wandering off with other people. And I knew that, you know, the best revenge is to get past the need for it. That was the mantra of my first book, Adulterous Wife, because revenge is such a toxic emotion. And you think you're hurting your partner, but you're really hurting yourself. And you're wasting your life energy thinking about revenge strategies when you could be spending that energy on making your life better than it was before, moving on. And although I certainly didn't feel that way at the time, right now I'm very grateful to my ex-husband and his former mistress, who is now his latest wife, because I am so much happier now than I was then. I didn't see it, but I, you know, even within the marriage, I didn't see it, but I am at so much happier. I have no regrets. No regrets at all. Because remember, regret is not about the past. It's about the present. And if you're happy with life as it is right now, you have no regrets. Again, the way you turn things around and just reframe it is so great. And so let's dive a little bit in deeper here, because this is October, uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And you and I spent time discussing, we really want to make sure we tie these all together. And so there is a connection, according to what you write in your book, between breast cancer and infidelity. Can you explain that a little bit? Because I don't think people may see the connection. Yes. Well, it actually goes both ways. Both can, uh, infidelity can cause cancer and cancer can cause infidelity. First of all, infidelity is a major stressor. Stress is a major cause of disease and in particular cancer. So when you're dealing with infidelity, you're also dealing with sometimes the death of your relationship. It is like a bereavement, and that's incredibly stressful. You also sometimes um, have to move out of your home, uh, particularly if you're separating or getting divorced. And that, again, is a major stressor. And the third major stressor is financial, because if you are divorcing, then if you're lucky, you might get 50% of what you had rather than 100%. And you're definitely not going to be better off divorced financially than you were when you were married. So those are major stresses that can and do cause disease and cancer. And there have been plenty of studies to show how stress creates cancer. And then the other way around too, um, uh, I was, was talking with Linda about her work with uh, one of the major breast cancer charities. Um, and she told me that she often saw marital issues and uh, people breaking up when, when the women were going through breast cancer. And there have been some studies done, one in particular by Michael Glantz that was based in Phoenix, I think the Barrow Institute study that showed a huge difference in um, the gender disparity when um, one partner is sick that the other partner leaves. Um, and in fact, the latest study that uh, Glantz did showed that men were 12 times more likely to leave a severely sick woman than the wives were likely to, to leave a severely sick husband. 12 times more likely. That is huge. Well, and I know in the book you mentioned that is it the woman does have that nurturing nature versus the man wanting to go, go, go? Flesh that out a little bit. Why, why is that sat so staggering and so important to realize? I think because women are caregivers. They are, you know, we obviously want to promote feminism and, and um, you know, equal roles in the household. But the fact is that um, from the Stone Age, um, it's been the women who have to not only bear and deliver the child, but also take care of the child. That is a, you know, a 20 year sentence, whereas all the man really has to do is, is, is have sex with a woman once and you've got the child <laughs> and you can wander off and, and have sex with somebody else. And, and sadly, that is the, um, you know, the, the way that we are um, wired from, from, from our biology. And yes, that's not to, to say that uh, there aren't a lot of men out there who are caring and considerate and, and all of that, but, but women do tend to be more prone to the caregiving role than men. No getting around it. You also 
did mention just a few minutes ago, the roller coaster, all those different things, the financial, the, the moving, everything going on. And I know as your speaking career continues to evolve, you also have a six part program that breaks some of that down. So people don't have to experience it alone. They actually have a template to help them get through the roller coaster. And can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, I found that I was doing six different things to help me get over that emotional roller coaster, particularly from the infidelity. Um, and I can touch on those briefly. The first thing that was very important was to find confidants and mentors with my best interests at heart that I could vent to, I could um, expose my deepest, darkest feelings that maybe even some of my friends wouldn't have wanted to hear. Um, and I would be able to trust them to be confidential and to give me some good advice. So that's really important. The second thing was related to that. I was building my circle of friends, both old and new. And I had found that, for example, when I was married, I'd let go of all my old friends. And I, all I had were friends that were connected with our business and that were friends of my uh, husband's. And those are not people you are going to be discussing your marital problems with, not at all, uh, if you wanna be professional. Um, so I made a point of rebuilding my friend base. I went back to old friends that, that I'd let go and, and I also made a lot of new friends and that community is absolutely critical to, uh, to make yourself feel better. So the third thing, which is part of my whole Monty Python um, creed, was laughter therapy. I wanted to do things that brought me up and made me laugh rather than, than were depressing. I, I gave up watching the news, for instance. I was a, um, as a BBC journalist, I would always keep up to date with world affairs. But, you know, the news is all bad news. So I gave up watching the news. I just focused on comedy, especially when I was going through cancer treatment. Absolutely. You don't want to be down and, and seeing depressing stuff. You want uplifting stuff that makes you laugh. And then the fifth thing was that I wanted to find my passion again, because as a um, married woman, it was very much nose to the grindstone, ministering to my husband, ministering to our business, ministering to our kids, ministering to the, you know, the home that we had together and it wasn't ministering to me. So I wanted to find my passion. And that can be a lot of different things for different people. You know, maybe you wanted to learn a musical instrument or you have a cause that you want to volunteer for. For me, it was writing and, um, you know, speaking and comedy. And, and that was it. Um, writing, you know, made my heart sing. And so it's always good to find your passion. Doesn't mean you have to throw away your day job and, and make your living as a saxophonist. You may not be able to do that, but, you know, find your passion. Um, you know, life is too short not to do what you want to do and what really makes you, makes your soul rise. Um, and then um, the other things that I did was I wanted to make sure I loved my body. By that, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I wanted to become beautiful, but not like a supermodel, because that's never going to happen, but more internal beauty, you know, looking after my diet, looking after sleeping enough, you know, exercising well. Outdoor exercise, I found, was one of the best antidepressants out there. No question. Um, you know, that was great. And then um, the final thing in the six part plan, which actually is always a work in progress, it's the most difficult, and that was living in the present and becoming more mindful. And if you think about it, all you have is now, what's past, you can worry about what you did and churn it in your head, but it's gone, you know, you can't bring it back. And you can also, you know, be really concerned about the future and how things are going to turn out. But who knows what's going to happen? You know, whatever you think might happen is fiction in your head until it happens. And so all you have is the now. So, so in a nutshell, those were the six things that I focused on. And that, that got me through both the infidelity and the breast cancer. And they're sprinkled in throughout the book, Mal, while wow, right. You, you, you highlight those and go deeper. So that's incredible that you have all that information and encouragement in there. The one thing we haven't touched on yet really is your book, My Wild Ride, has cartoons in it. Now, <laughs> I, I, I love pictures and books, okay? There, I'm totally there with you. But why was it so important for you to put the cartoons in such a serious, heavy book? Well, 
it was a humorous self-help book. And I mean, I saw the Monty Python style humor in everything that happened to me, even if it was dark. And so, for example, one of my favorite cartoons is in the introduction. I don't know if you can see it well here. Yes, we can. Um, and this is, uh, this may be a cartoon, but it is true. This is all the kind of advice that I got when I was going through cancer. And anybody going through cancer is going to be besieged with unsolicited advice. And it's going to be conflicting advice and some of these people get very fire and brim, brimstone on you. It's like they're, they're fire and brimstone preachers. If you don't do what I say, you will die, you know, kind of thing. So I got the people who were not happy about me doing conventional medicine. And they were saying, oh, you know, chemo and radiation is toxic and doesn't work. And then the people who were more sort of straight laced and didn't approve of alternative medicine, and knew that I was actually doing quite a lot of alternative therapies as well, they would say, oh, alternative medicine is pure quackery. Um, so you really couldn't please anybody. And then one person in particular, who shall remain nameless to protect his identity, was very good at shouting at me and telling me that the reason why I got cancer was because I'm so tense and I need to relax. And of course, everybody knows that if you shout at somebody, it's a very good way to make them relax, isn't it? You try that on your, on your child. That'll work so well. Just shout at them and, and that'll really relax them. No, it won't. Um, and then the final thing that was really common were the food Nazis who were telling me that I had to give up this, had to give up that. You know, If you don't give up dairy, one of my friends told me, your cancer's gonna come back. Well, I'm a Brit. I have to have real milk in my tea and not some kind of fake Oaty or soy milk or hemp milk or some horrible concoction like that. No, it's got to be real milk. And I'm not giving that up. And I'm still here, despite not necessarily listening to all this conflicting advice. Amazingly, I have the, the badge here to prove it. I'm not dead yet. So here we go. Until I'm dead, I can hold this badge from Spamalot and tell you I'm still alive. <laughs> Believe me, her humor comes through in the book, the way she read and set it up. You're going to love this read of this book. Coming up, we will share the link so you can order it through Amazon, other places, but you do want to get involved with this. The, the other thing you did with this, CJ, was you really went all in with details of going through treatment. Uh, I love the chapter on wigs. Um, you talk about bras and breasts. I mean, you went... I mean, she used boobs, okay? She, she went all in with real conversation on the book. Bras and breasts, you said there's also a link there. Can you quickly highlight part of that chapter a little bit? Yes, um, I did a ton of reading and research, both for my own cancer journey and also for writing the book. Um, it's very unusual in the sense that it's got a, a really long bibliography. Uh, and uh, one of the books that struck me more than any of the other ones that I read was called Dressed to Kill, the link between breast cancer and bras by Sidney Ross Singer and Soma Grissmeyer. There's the book, Dressed to Kill. The second edition is actually better than the first edition. And they present compelling evidence that the link between bras and breast cancer is actually stronger than the link between smoking and lung cancer. And in fact, they found in certain societies that, were, uh, that didn't wear Western clothing, that the instance of breast cancer was more or less the same between men and women. Wow, I mean, how many men do you know with breast cancer? I think I know one person because he has, a, he has a, um, a podcast about it. But for women, I know dozens and dozens and dozens of people who've had breast cancer. So, so for me, that was mega. And, and what I found sad about this was that there, they, these authors thought that they would be welcomed with open arms by the mainstream cancer community, but they were not. Um, and this, it's, the material that they present has not been accepted by the mainstream. And instead, um, the mainstream cancer community point to a study that was done in 2014, just one study that had no control group. And it also looked at post-menopausal women in whom the effects of bras and breast cancer was weaker. And surprise, surprise, that 2014 study showed no link 
between bras and breast cancer. But there is a ton of other research out there that shows the link is pretty damn strong. So whether I am deluded in believing this, I was convinced. And what I did was, here's my bra, I threw it away. I'm done wearing bras. So um, if that prevents me or one other woman from getting breast cancer or me getting it again, because I've already had it, um, it's definitely worth it to mention it in my book. <laughs> so I did. And, and again, this is why the book is so compelling. She really does get raw, authentic, but she also backs it up with data and information. Uh, it's your decision, agree or disagree with it, but she went in and shared it. Um, chapter one, I thought was very interesting. And I want to read again, a, just a small excerpt from chapter one about building that support team. Uh, building the support team, I know personally from my own medical stuff is huge, but you sized it up really well here when you said, when facing serious illness, there are various doctors and medical decisions to deal with. You need a champion crusading for your welfare, an advocate to help you navigate the system and support of your best interest. I don't think you could have said it any better. Explain to everybody why that's so important that you have that champion when you're going through everything you're going through. Well, you have to do it because otherwise you may not be making the best decisions and there are a hell of a lot of decisions to make. Um, in my case, I was my own champion. I was my own advocate. I did have all kinds of emotional and physical support from my team of friends and my wonderful sons. But I knew that I had to embrace my inner anal journalist. BBC training and all of that to get the answers I wanted. I knew that I was going to be the best person to do my own research and make those decisions. But my mantra for dealing with breast cancer was information is power. And I think it's always good to be, um, you know, to find out what you're doing. And um, it's also interesting to note that um, for many people, you are suffering, you may have chemo brain, um, which fogs up your, your, your um, mental capacities. So in those cases, it is good to have somebody else that you can rely on to help you make those decisions, to drive you to your appointments, to help you remember your appointments if your memory is this sort of affected. Um, so, so yes, you do need a team. Um, and generally for most people, it's a good idea for that person to be somebody else other than they themselves. But for me, I knew that at least in terms of making the medical choices, I had to be my own advocate. But you also had your son involved, you had a boyfriend at one point involved, you had other people, but you were still the captain of your ship steering it, but you did have support. Oh, yes. And I think it, it would be, it would have been brutal and sad to have had no one. I mean, if it had been just the case of, um, as it appeared, because my, my, my ex-husband, he wasn't an ex-husband at the time, um, when I found out about the infidelity, he offered me a part-time wife position. I'd be perfectly happy spending two or three days a week with her and the rest of the week with you, he said. And um, I actually considered that for a while, trying to get my head around it. But when I was sitting in the you know, chemotherapy facility, having an IV in my vein, and he was in Europe with his girlfriend, uh, not, doesn't work. Nope, nope, part-time wife position didn't work. And so I was very fortunate it would have been depressing and sad and 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 much more grueling if i hadn't had the support of my sons and my boyfriend and my um friend circle so uh, yeah it's absolutely vital and i was fortunate that i had sort of built that beforehand to deal with the uh, infidelity because the infidelity happened first and then i had to revisit all of the all of the sort of self-therapy I had that six-part plan um, to, to get over the, the breast cancer diagnosis, at least emotionally, because it, it certainly does a number on your head. <laughs> Coming up, everybody, we are going to open up microphones, the chat box in just a few moments. You get to ask your questions, talk directly to CJ. We'll bring you in on cen uh, center stage, start getting ready for your questions. But CJ, also in the book, you talk about BRCA gene, and that's a controversy for some reason. But you, again, you went there in my wild ride. Talk about the BRCA. 
Yes, um, I um, think most people think of that from what Angelina Jolie did. She was she went very public with having prophylactic mastectomies because of her BRCA1 profile. I actually have the BRCA2 profile, which is slightly less bad than the BRCA1. But I, um, I made the decision not to have mastectomies. Many people thought I was nuts to do that. I was advised by um, a couple of my doctors to have mastectomies. Um, but I looked at the problems with breast implant illness, which is very, very real. Um, and I And I didn't want to go flat after having that operation as some women are now choosing to do. And I looked at the data and it seemed to me that for my own particular situation, I was just as well off with lumpectomies as I was with mastectomies. And mastectomies are a big deal. You lose a lot of muscle. You have um, sometimes pain from that. You have arm, sometimes difficulty moving your arms in a way that you didn't have before. And breast implant illness can create a whole range of various mm -hmm. um, problems. So um, the BRCA gene though, I felt that um, when Angelina Jolie was in the news about that, I thought they should have publicized much more the ovarian cancer risk of that gene because um, her mother who had breast cancer, in fact, died of ovarian cancer, not of breast cancer. And you have a much higher instance of ovarian cancer with that gene profile than a, than a the regular um, population would have. So I um, did, I waited till I finished menopause because I didn't want to get slammed into it artificially but I did have my um, ovaries and the fallopian tubes removed, which is called an oophorectomy. I, God knows why they have that name, but it's an oophorectomy. And my sister, she chose to have a full hysterectomy. I chose not to do that because I felt that the, um, to get everything removed, mm, I, I saw side effects of that and that um, the uterus is actually quite good for keeping everything else in its place. So I, I just thought less is more, I'll just, get rid of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes. So if you have the BRCA gene, it's definitely worthwhile considering that because ovarian cancer, once they find it, it's usually too late. It's a tiny little organ and, and the cancer can go right into the body cavity after, afterwards. So um, it's, it's much more serious. So that's what I would say. I, I, I felt that I the breast cancer risk is statistically higher, but less damaging less dangerous than the ovarian cancer risk again this book my wild ride is packed full of so much information i'm going to drop right now for everyone if you want to grab the link the amazon link is right here you can go to it order it we're going to keep talking one final question with cj here before we move on and get you ready for your questions with your sense of humor, with your love of mighty python and my humor is very similar in a different way and i know this from my own medical stuff the joy and the laughter, the humor throws people off. Did you experience the fact that some people said, hey, CJ, you know, this is pretty serious. Why don't you just, you know, lay off the comedy and get serious about this? Did you ever get challenged on your use of humor to deal with the reality of what you were going through? I got challenged in one way um, because the original title of this book was going to be Hotel Chemo, Learning to Laugh Through Breast Cancer and Infidelity. And then my wonderful writing mentor, Diane Sward Rappaport, came down with terminal pancreatic cancer. And at that time, I thought, I think I'm insulting her by having that title because it's not a laughing matter. So we had this discussion and I said, well, is this, a, this isn't a good title, is it? No, no. I said, do you feel like you're on a wild ride with what you're doing and she said oh yes this is a wild ride and so that was how the new title was born my wild ride how to thrive after breast cancer and infidelity but i will say that you do need humor you need humor to be able to talk about dark subjects to make mm -hmm. them more palatable i mean i've even got humor in the final chapter which is about death and dying and yes. i've got a cartoon in there but you know and it's called resting in peace but there is a lot of information in there, but I don't think you need to sort of hammer people over the head with the darkness of a subject to get them to understand it. I think you do a much better job when you're lighter and you bring in humor. That's my view. It also lets people take a breather reading an intense book like this. 
it helps them go, okay, I can go on because there's so much messiness, but also gloriness uh, in that as well. CJ, thank you very much. I'm going to bring in a friend of yours, uh, Paul James Brown. Now, Paul is celebrating his 25th year in Maui. I'm jealous, Paul. Uh, uh, he's a cancer survivor and a caregiver himself. He, he lost the love of his life to, um, uh, mistest, mis I butchered the name, I'm sorry, Paul, uh, to breast cancer in 2007. I'm going to read Paul in, give my tongue a break. And uh, Paul, what do you have to say about your good friend, CJ? Thank you, Richard. And thank you, um, CJ, for the opportunity to um, chat about your amazing um, book. Um, one of the things that really struck me about the about the book was um, because I because I was a caregiver and my late wife had breast cancer for um, ten years. Um, it, it's metastatic breast cancer that she died from, um, and um, the thing that struck me was the the men who um, who uh, de desert their women um, when they're at their when they're the need is the most. It just did not ring any way. Um, I was I, I had never even thought about the possibility that if you love somebody, that you would not only abandon them, but that you would you would go back on the vow of in sickness and in health. And to me, that's those vows. Vows are vows, and you and you make those vows you know, in, in public, in front of God and in front of the community. And, and those vows are things that you live by for the rest of your life, at, le at least for me. And, and I couldn't imagine not being there for Betty every step of the way. When, her, when, when I wasn't with her at her chemo treatments, her daughter was there. So to me, it was it was like a foreign language to read how appalling CJ had been treated um, by um, other people who are who allegedly um, loved her. Uh, it it really just took me it took my breath away. Um, but the the other part of this book that really really struck me um, was the memoir aspect of it, um, where she bears herself, where she strips herself naked, and uh, and and at the same time laughs at that while she's in a life-threatening situation. It, it to me was an absolutely extraordinary way in which to present a, a one of the greatest challenges that a human being can face. And not only did she face it once, but she faced it twice and she got through it. And so for everybody who's listening, this book is is really a guide to ways in which to survive this horrible illness. Now, it's not a guarantee. There's no guarantees in life, especially with this illness. But CJ has done such an incredible job of not only experiencing this, but in thoroughly researching every aspect of the illness as she was going through it and sharing that with everyone. Her bibliography is extraordinary. And all I can say is, I wish the book had been written about 20 years ago. Wow. Paul, thank you very much for that. CJ, got any words for Paul? Taking my breath away. Um, you know, there's so much heart and feeling in, in, in what he said. And um, I didn't even realize until Paul told me that my book was well-researched because that's, I just embraced my anal journalist. And then when I looked at my book, I thought, oh my God, I've got over a hundred studies that I reference here and, and almost uh, 70 books. Uh, that's not actually that normal and certainly not for a comedy self-help book that's a memoir too it's it's so it's unusual <laughs> on that level but thank you so much paul that was a, a beautiful thing to say so as, as we move forward this is gonna be time to open up for q a if you have cameras off feel free to turn them on keep microphones muted we're going to bring you in we're going to use the digital reaction button down there and you can bring the hand up to ask a question uh so please join us if you want to with video uh, we also do have a Wheel of Fortune coming up for prizes, autographed books, and other things. So stick around to the very end. 
And CJ, on that bibliography, we do have to announce you do have a gamification. Even in there, you have two titles of books, but there's something special about those titles, correctly? Well, I have this sort of Monty Python absurdity that happens all the time. It's just the way my mind works. And I did this in both the Adulterer's Wife book, the earlier book, this one, and the later book, the um, My Wild Ride, which you can see behind me. Um, I put in three book titles in each of those two bibliographies that are genuine titles. They're just bizarre titles that I like and they have absolutely nothing to do with my book. So in My Wild Ride, we've got 68 titles in the bibliography, but three of them are the sort of semi spoof titles. And if you actually buy the book and you go to the QR code at the end, and um, uh, uh, and enter in there. You can actually enter a competition, and if you find the three spoof titles and tell me about them, you will win. At least the first twenty people that find them, um, you'll win an ebook of the other title. Um, so if you do it for My Wild Ride, you will win uh, an ebook copy of Adulterer's Wife if you're one of the first 20. And I'm going to be entering that competition. I haven't loaded the competition for the other book yet, but um, it's, it's got the same, same thing in it. So currently the competition is, you buy my wild ride, you go and um, register with that QR code at the back of the book, and you write down the three spoof titles and you will get a free ebook copy Amazon Kindle ebook copy of uh, The Adulterer's Wife, How to Thrive, Whether You Stay or Not. At least the first 20 of you guys will get that. <laughs> so again, there's the Amazon link. Go after it, get in early, have some fun. Now here's where you get to ask the question. If you have a question for CJ, I see a digital hand go up. That's the way you do it. And you get right in there and uh, briefly ask the question. Let's see how many questions we can get through here. I see Joyce has her hand on up. Joyce, we're gonna bring you front and center. And we're going to add you to the conversation. Welcome. Thanks for being here. What's your question for CJ tonight? Uh, thank you so much. And I just want to honor CJ. She is an amazing human being. And I'm so, so grateful to be a part of this book launch. My question for lovely CJ is, what is your favorite humorous piece that helped you to get through this that you included in your book? And please describe it. Thank you. There is something uh, very bizarre in there that I think, to my mind, because I have such a twisted sense of humor, I think it's the funniest part in there. I, I have a section called Tight Assed Brit. And there I talk about entering the weird and wonderful world of colonics, because one of the problems of um, going through chemotherapy was that it created constipation sorry to talk about something like that in this kind of community here but uh, but I had I mean the the, the stuff that my um uh, colonic therapy lady was going on about was 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 priceless I mean she would have a, a a video screen going on so you could see what was happening but I have to say it wasn't an Oscar winning uh, performance it wouldn't it wouldn't be there on the Oscars but but it was so that to me I think that's the funniest part of the book some other people might not, <laughs> but, but it, it appealed to my, my absurd humor, absurd sense of humor. Um, so I'm wondering whether I could also answer Lisanne's question in the chat. She was curious to know my, um, how I dealt with the um, insurance and healthcare system and whether I did anything in Britain with the NHS. No, I was fortunate enough to do this all in the United States with very good health insurance. And I'm sad to say that it is so important to have good health insurance. And, and I, have, I do have a section in the book about, um, very sad, somebody that was telling me that their good friend had no health insurance mm -hmm. at the time and that he had curable cancer, but he could not afford the treatment and he died. He died unnecessarily. Um, another story in there, somebody that was with the National Health Service in England had, um, she, she went to her doctor, her local doctor, for two years before he agreed to do um, a scan of the lump she was feeling in her breast. 
surprise, surprise, she died of metastatic breast cancer. So it is very, it, it's sad to say that your treatment options and the quality of care is, is directly proportional to how good your health insurance is and how much money you have. And all of the alternative treatments I did, if you don't have any money to do them, uh, lots of luck. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it, that is a big, a big, big issue because even the alternative stuff is fairly costly. So David had a follow-up question very similar to that. Uh, he said, there's alternative options out there. How did you determine which one was effective and which ones were bunk? He really wants to know which ones did you find the most effective? So go, 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 go a little bit deeper. Explain how you broke it down for you. Yes, I mean, you have to have a track record. And the trouble with a lot of the non-patentable alternative treatments is that there's no way that anybody's going to do highly, highly uh, costly double-blind uh, studies on those, which is supposedly the only way that uh, these things are accepted by Western medicine. Um, but, you know, there are lots of observational studies and studies from other countries, and there are study and there's um, data that you can get from people who've actually done these things. I did a lot of research. I was very lucky also that um, I had relatives in both the conventional and the alternative fields, so I could find out from them what was good and what was not so good. Um, uh, yeah, you are looked on as a cash cow. Uh, sometimes when you when you're sick, when you go to both conventional and alternative doctors, and I do write about that in the book too. Mm -hmm. So there is no substitute from do, for, for doing your research. As I said earlier, information is power, and if if it's not something that they're going to have done studies on, you want um, examples of people who have been there, done that, and had good results, um, and then you know then that's that's worth doing. We have time for one more quick question, either live or in the chat, either one. Does someone have a digital hand they want to raise? If you want to drop one in to the uh, chat box, please let me know and we will field the question. Otherwise, we've got more good stuff. Again, stay around. We're going to spin the wheel and you could win autograph books and fun stuff from CJ. And let's see, we got one more coming in. What is the best alternative treatment to go with the conventional treatments? What would you say to do the combo there? Um, yeah, I think it's a shame that, that Western medicine doesn't combine alternative with, with conventional very well. And I will, I do have to say, I am not a doctor and, uh, you know, cancer is a very individual thing. So I would never want to tell somebody what they should do. I can only tell you what I did. And um, it's always good to get the advice of a doctor that you trust. Um, in my case, I did, um, I found that, um, IV ozone was extremely helpful. I didn't do it while I was going through chemotherapy. It is a uh, controversial therapy, but it's been used to great effect um, in um, foreign countries, including Cuba, for example, for a number of different um, it, uh, problems. And it's been used um, in different parts of the world for an, a number of problems and very effectively. But you know, you also need to go to a good practitioner and you need to know what you're doing um, and it isn't for everybody. Uh, so, so that's what I found to be very helpful. Um, and uh, I did use supplements as well. Um, and I think that different people will find that different things resonate with them. Um, and I do wish that um, there was more integration of alternative with conventional treatment these days. But so far, that's not the case, not in the United States. CJ, this has been great. We're getting the feedback, the conversations, and I'm going to bring in one more friend of yours right now. And uh, Tina Lee is an artist, a business consultant living on the island of Maui. Again, Tina, double, double jealous. Uh, she's also a friend of yours for a very long time. So Tina, I'm going to bring you in center stage. Would love to have you share um, some of your thoughts about CJ, her authorship, and this amazing book. Aloha. And yeah, I am uh, very lucky to call CJ my friend. And I can tell you she is fabulous. She's she's just really something. <laughs> um, she's a great storyteller. She has a gift for that. Uh, and she does do her research, like Paul said. Um, you know, she really knows what she's talking about. And um, I, I always learn something new from her. You know, whatever conversation we're having, I feel like I, I learned something and she just has so much knowledge and she has this great sense of humor. 
Uh, she's able to take topics like cancer and infidelity and, and bring stories that are, you know, full of laughter and, and hopefulness. And it's just really beautiful. And I'm so proud of her. I know she's been working super hard on this book. Every time I would see her, she was, you know, I got to go do my book. So <laughs> this is exciting um, moment for her. And I think it's going to be a big seller. And um I can't wait to find out more about what is in there. I haven't gotten to take a look yet. Um, and uh, the other thing about CJ is that she's an adventurer and she just knows how to live life to the fullest. I imagine she's always been like that, but it seems like this experience has really um, brought that out in her and it's just inspiring. And she, you know, she loves to go get in the ocean every morning and I look at her perspective on life as someone who just jumps right in and whatever waves come her way she she rides those waves and she does it with a smile on her face and um you know not only that but she she's completely fearless I've seen her jump on stage grab a microphone and just launch into a stand-up comedy routine you know out of nowhere she tells me I'm doing stand-up comedy I'm like perfect <laughs> that fits you that's perfect and she's great at it and she gets better every time I see her and she's just she's just so unique and um I think there's really probably not anyone who could tell you know these kind of stories the way that she does so I'm really looking forward to seeing what she's she's done here with the book and I just want to say congratulations and lots of love here from from your friend and aloha I'll see you on the beach CJ that's wonderful. Any comments going the other way, CJ, here for a second? Wow. Well, thank you, Tina, and uh, everyone who's said such wonderful words about me. Are you talking about me or is it somebody else? Surely it can't be. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, uh, no, I'm not that wonderful. I'm pretty ordinary and kind of boring. I'm, no, I, I'm trying not to be boring, actually. <laughs> so we're going to open up the prize wheel in just a moment. But we're also going to drop in all of her social media links. Uh, you do want to follow her. You do want to connect with her. And you support her as she speaks and goes out. So this is the social side of CJ. And CJ, we had, we had fun the, the, the other day in our live. I want you to, what's the name of your website again? Um, the name of the website, I'm going to say it in British first, cjauthor.com. And in American, is cjarthur.com because some people, when I say it the English way, the British English way, think that I'm talking about somebody called Arthur as in the round table. No, it's author as in somebody that writes a book. So cjarthur.com, <laughs> that's me. And I will so, say it's available on Amazon both as an ebook and as a paperback as of now. And again, it literally is live today. We, we intentionally wanted to put this all together live in the moment for you. So you're getting first dibs, everybody. Um, CJ, it's time to spin, spin the lucky wheel. You and I get to moderate this, have some fun. We're going to go with prize number one. It'll be the autographed copy of your new book, My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. So there it is. She's going to play Vanna White. I am going to bring this up on the screen now. And... We are going to spin the wheel. Everyone's name has been plugged in here as best we can. You must be present to win, whether you are in the chat box or live on camera with us. So, CJ, you get the honor of saying spin the wheel or, or, or whatever you want to say. Let's all go for a spin. Andrew, is Andrew still with us tonight? Let's see if Andrew is still in the house here. Wow, it's his 60th birthday today, so he's got his birthday present. Is Andrew in the house with us? I think he is, because he's um I'm... he's he's on the same line as as Joyce. So he is right. definitely How... okay. You get I, lucky. I couldn't Brian. find out to shut the mic. I couldn't find out to turn the mic on. Sorry, I am here. My my phone connection isn't powerful enough to do video or I'll be cut off. So <laughs> Well, thank you for being here with us. We will connect with you via email and get you a copy of the book. But congratulations, you get yourself that autographed copy. Can and I just say something? I just I think CJ is amazing. I'm so glad she got her book done. And congratulations. Look forward to seeing what's in it. 
great. And it's like, I'm sorry, we can't see your beautiful 60 year old face. <laughs> <laughs> this is my connection will cut me off. You'll just be cut off quick. So, all right. Take Thank care. you. Congratulations. So here we're going to go back over and we're going to bring up our magic wheel. CJ, oh. you did such a great job there. Give us another lucky spin. Do your job here, CJ. Okay, let's go for another spin. And we get Sandra Olson. Is Sandra with us here tonight still in the gallery? If you are, unmute yourself, jump on in. Sandra, oh, where are you? Sandra is not here. We get to re-spin this. Here we go oh, again, everybody. Sandra, where are you? Oh. This is where, you know, you've got to be present to win, everybody. So let's go one more time. We're going to spin the lucky wheel here. And don't stare too, too long. Your, your brain's going to blow up. But uh, here we go. And we have... Hey, Navi. you know this one. Congratulations. By the way, Navi, just so you know what you get, you get the autographed copy of Adulterous Wife and My Wild Ride Boats. You get two autographed copies from CJ. Real briefly, you got anything special to say about your good friend? Yeah, um, I think that CJ is absolutely amazing. And I think that a lot of times when people talk about difficult things, they either talk about it from this cold place of like having been through it already that now the vulnerability is gone and people can't relate to it anymore, or they're so in the grief that it's actually really hard to read. And CJ just has this incredible gift. She can dig right in there and go into the vulnerable part of the story, but share it from this just uplifting place where you can still really connect to it, but it's not dragging you down, it's inspiring you, but at the same time, you're going through the emotions with her. And I just think that that's such a rare gift and you're just so incredibly gifted. And the way that you add humor to things, the way that you make difficult things easy to talk about. And I think um, just the biggest thing um, about, CJ's books are, it's not just about somebody who's going through breast cancer, infidelity. If you're going through any struggle in your life, you can connect to her struggles and just the experiences she's gone through because she's so real with her emotions. And it's not just, she doesn't just put in, okay, just, just do this. She actually has real tangible steps, right? Like sometimes people put in just like something really broad and really general, and you can read a book and you can walk away and there's nothing there for you to implement in your life. This book or any of her books are just really a guide that you can take and you can implement and you can actually use it to change your life. Well, thank you, Navi, for being a winner, being with us from here tonight and adding a bonus uh, testimonial in here as well. We have the grand prize ready to go here now. And for the grand prize tonight, we're going to do autographed copies of both books, The Adulterous Wife, How to Thrive, Whether You Stay or Not, my Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. You also get a 30-minute one-on-one session with CJ Grace. And she has two PDF resources that you get a part of her resource library. So the grand prize, chock full, we're ready to go. CJ, you get to be the one to officially uh, tell me when to launch this off. Take it away. Let's go for a nice spin, the third and last spin. Here we go. Grand prize winner will be Gary. Is Gary still around tonight? Wow. Gary That's... is a journalist, a local journalist. Is he here? Is Gary still with us? I saw his name earlier. Let's and see. let's just check and see. Gary, no, he is not still with us as far as I can see. I'm going to spin again. And let me bring this back up here, everybody. How are you guys? <laughs> and... We're going to do the grand prize over again. Still in the running. Remember, we will send these books to you. We'll have your emails and get in touch with you. And here for the grand prize, Stephen. Is Stephen still with us tonight? And some of these, let's see here. Uh, Steve Borish? Yes. There he is, oh. Stephen. I see your name still on the list. You're still active. But Steve, we will have your email. We will get in touch with you. And CJ will package it up, bundle it up 
send it out there with love. CJ, your book launch party is coming to a magnificent ending, wonderful time here tonight. In closing, what would be your final thoughts to share with everybody about your new book, My Wild Ride? Well, I think that if I could wave a magic wand and make that cancer and the infidelity never have happened, would I do it? The answer is no. Um, I'm very grateful that I am in the place I'm in right now. And I think that um, both you and I, Rich, because you've been through medical challenges yourself, are proof that um, sometimes adversity is a really good catalyst to make your life better than it was before. So there's always hope. And if you read my book, you're going to find all kinds of tools to get through challenges like cancer, like dealing with infidelity. And you'll find that, you know, now is the time. Now is the time to do it. If not now, when? Now is the time to make your life the best it can possibly be. And that's really the aim of all of my writing, both My Wild Ride and Adulterer's Wife. I want to get rid of suffering. I don't want people to suffer unnecessarily when they're going through these kinds of challenges. And I want them to laugh. So that's, that's the, those are the two main things. Laughter I, and I, ending I, suffering. Good, laudable aims, I think. I promised you we'll get some good chuckles. You may even chuckle out loud, especially some of the cartoons. Uh, you may hang and ponder them a little bit. It is a marvelous book, marvelous read. And again, tonight, CJ Grace has been great to celebrate and launch her book officially now for everybody. Be sure to order My, My Wild Ride, How to Thrive After Breast Cancer and Infidelity. Be, for, be sure to give her a like, a comment on Amazon. It helps generate more leads and more activities. So please share your thoughts. And again, she has survived twice breast cancer along with facing the infidelity. And she is shining bright. She is doing a marvelous job. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your journey with us here tonight. That's going to do it for our, for our book launch party here this evening. My name is Rich Bond, Trigger the Trigger. Watch for more Brock the Stage Media book launch parties coming up. Thank you for spending your time with us. Everyone have a great night and we'll see you soon. <laughs>